Good, good. The title of our lesson today is Why a Temple? Why a Temple? And also the side, uh, the little subtitle there is Don't Give Up. And we'll go into our lesson here and you'll understand what I mean as we go forward. We're going to start in Genesis 127. One thing that I've learned about scripture is it does tend to repeat itself throughout. You get clarity as you read scripture. You don't want to just read one scripture and say, aha! You want to take scripture from beginning to end and understand the context of what's being said. Not just this or that. You want to make sure you understand the context. So Genesis 127 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female created he them. God wanted to have a relationship, a bond with something, someone. He made all these animals, but yet he chose to create in his image. And we've talked about this before. God is a triune being, three parts, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Well, when he created us, he created us a triune being. We have flesh, we have a human spirit, and we have our soul area, which is our mind, will, and emotions. He wanted to have fellowship, a relationship with us. We all know what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and they were actually separated sorry, from God because of their sin. And when that happened, God had to prepare a way for us to be reconnected to him in relationship with him. And what's his name? Jesus. He sent Jesus for that reason. And what I have found in reading and studying the word of God is when you start in the beginning of the word, you find out he's all about relationship. Well, guess what? In the very end, guess what he's all about? Relationship. Wow. In Revelations 21, 7, it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son or daughter. He wants relationship with us. So throughout scripture, as we read, we see interactions with God and his people. One of the things that God wanted us to know is that he wants to dwell with us. So he started off in the garden, explaining to them, I will dwell with you. He walked with them in the cool of the day. Whenever Moses had his tabernacle, he wanted to... to be with the people. That's why he gave the instructions to Moses to build the tabernacle. We see in the New Testament, Pastor Bob just shared it, he did that work for us so that he can do a work in us. Well, he wants to be in us so he could flow through us. Also, he wants a relationship with us in heaven forever and ever and ever. This isn't just a walk down here, folks. This is a forever love a forever relationship. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about why a temple. Why would God choose a temple to demonstrate his love for us? We're going to look at Moses' temple first and foremost. Now on the screen here, I've got a um, little PowerPoint that we've got a couple little pictures to show you what these temples might actually look like. Now, the tabernacle was constructed a very long time ago. It was one of the first temples that God showed in Scripture. While the people were in the wilderness, when Moses was leading them in the wilderness, they had escaped from Egypt. They entered into the promised land under Joshua. And the tabernacle was originally located in Gilgal whenever Joshua brought them into the promised land. Later it was moved. It went throughout different areas. After that, we don't hear anything else about it. It had been in use for a long time. There's speculation that there's a chance that, you know, the the skins eventually probably wore down. The the wood and everything that was used to build it with probably wore. But there is no definition of exactly what happened to the tabernacle. 
We do see, however, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. It actually disappeared during the time of captivity, and no one knows what happened to it after that. We see that it went farther than even the tabernacle itself. Now, once this, this Moses' tabernacle was explained to the people, when the fire of God was over the top of the tabernacle in the nighttime, they would follow that fire. So if the fire moved, they had to pack it up and move too. And in the daytime, it was the cloud. If the cloud moved, they had to pack it up and follow it as well. That fire and that cloud was representative of God's glory, his power, his presence, dwelling in a tabernacle or a temple. This is one of the first ones defined in scripture. Then we have David's tent. Lo and behold, things started happening. The tabernacle was, who knows, fell apart, they misplayed, whatever, who knows. But here we have David using a tent to guard the Ark of the Covenant. And the very next slide is just a depiction of what they think, you know, was a little tent set up with the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant inside of it. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, it shows the account of when they brought this Ark of God into the city of David with gladness. How many of you guys remember the story of him kind of dancing around in his underwear and his wife, Michael, was not real happy about seeing his hus her husband out there dancing in his underwear. He didn't care what he looked like. He had no fear of what people would say about him and what they thought. He was going to worship his God no matter what. And when they were carrying that ark through the city of God, they were so excited. There was this anticipation. And David wanted so much to build a tent or a building that would house the Ark of the Covenant where the power of glory of God could dwell. He longed for that. He yearned for that. But in Scripture, we find out that God told him, you know, you've been a warrior, you have a lot of blood on your hands, but the one that comes after you, your son, Solomon, will be the one to build my house. So that's where we come into Solomon's temple. Now, I've actually got two pictures up here of Solomon's temple. This one right here, you know, it's hard to know exactly what these look like from so far gone, but they have given us a couple of ideas. So this is one, and if you'll go to the next screen, this is a, a view from the outer court, so to speak, where you have the, the labor outside and the, the altar where they actually have their sacrifices. Now Solomon's temple to the Jews is actually considered the first temple to them. They look at it as a temple, not the tabernacle, but the first temple. And it was built in 957 BC by King Solomon. It is one of the best known temples mentioned in scripture. It was enormous. It was beautiful. It was so amazing that the, the people were just astonished at its beauty and how well it was put together. We're talking about the richest wisest man on the planet built this or, or orchestrated the building of this thing. It was amazing. Now, later on, it was destroyed in 587 BC by the Babylonians because the Babylonians came in and they took over and they tore it down. Can you imagine how the people must have felt? What if you came to church on Sunday morning and this building was down, and all you saw was rubble. How would that make you feel? Pretty low. Pretty low. I, I mean, really, it would, it, would, it would make us lose heart maybe even, like, Lord have mercy, how are we going to meet? There's a 100% chance of rain today. What are we going to do? You know? But what happened, let's just, let me just read it straight from here. It was destroyed. It's taking over everyone until they're, where do they belong? So their heart is longing to go back to their home. They're longing to worship God the way that God ordained them to worship, but they're living in a foreign land. How about I just take you up and put you right in the middle of Mexico? You come here Sunday morning and the church is flat. 
and then I'm going to put you on a plane and ship you over to Mexico, and then you're going to have to work there. Huh, no, we're not going to cold. <laughs> but seriously, how would you feel? You're in the middle of nowhere. You, your family that you know in church is gone. Where's that connection? Where's that, that feeling of security? It's stripped from you. You, ha- you. It's gone. You better know in whom you serve when something like that happens. These people were struggling. They were struggling. They were sad. They were so sad that even Nehemiah was one of those who were taken out of Jerusalem as a leader and was put as the cupbearer to the king of Persia. Here he is, the cupbearer, a respected man, or he would not have been the cupbearer. He gets to drink from the cup, see if there's any poison in it before the king gets to drink it. So if there was poison in it, he was out. He was a respected man. So here we have Zerubbabel bringing in the first number group of Jews. They returned after the Babylonian captivity the first year of King Cyrus of Persia. He gave them permission to go back. Ezra was also among them as well. And some of you will hear these names and you'll say, wait a minute, I know Ezra. That's a book in the Bible. Yes, if you read the book of Ezra, you'll hear what Ezra as a priest had to say to the people during that era in Scripture. It's really important to understand when you're reading Scripture what era you're reading about. Was it Old Testament? Was it during the captivity? Was it during Jesus' time? It's real important to understand when these things occur. According to the book of Ezra, the construction of the second temple, now remember the first temple is whose temple? Solomon's temple. The second temple is actually called Herod's temple. Because later on after they made it, Herod kind of took over. Yeah, it's two down from there. There you go. And this is, this is what we're talking about, the building of this actual temple that occurred. So let me just read straight from my page. According to the book of Ezra, the construction of the second temple was authorized by Cyrus the Great, and it began in 538 B.C. after the fall of the Babylonian Empire. It was completed 23 years later, the third day of Adar, in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the Great. And it was dedicated by the Jewish governor, Zerubbabel. So here's Zerubbabel was one of the first to go with all these people, he ended up becoming the governor of that area. So around 20 BC, the building was renovated by Herod the Great. That's why they call this temple Herod's Temple. Now, today, now the Romans destroyed this during the siege of Jerusalem. That's the one that I was trying to make a note of. The Romans came in, took over Jerusalem, flattened it. Nothing was there. You know what's there today? Does anyone know what's on this site today? I know Linda knows. Mike, yeah. Okay, let's see what's there today. Does anybody recognize this next picture? The Dome of the Rock. Okay, after the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem in the 7th century, I am not going to try to pronounce this person's name. It is very difficult to say. He ordered the construction of the Islamic shrine, that's what that is, the Dome of the Rock, on the site of where the temple actually stood. The shrine has been there since 691. The Temple Mount, along with the entire old city of Jerusalem, was captured from Jordan by Israel in 1967 during the Six-Day War, which allowed the Jews once again to pray at the holy site. But Israel kind of handed it over to the Muslim trust so they can manage it and administrate. But Israel officially unified East Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount, with the rest of Jerusalem in 1980 under the Jerusalem Law. So this really does belong to Jerusalem, even today. Now, I told you all that to give you a picture of temples, how important temples are. What takes place in Israel 
We need to watch what's happening in Israel because these things will take place spiritually in our lives and in, in our body as a church, not just in this building, but the body as a belie- of believers. Now, we're going to start in the midst of these temples. I want to take some time to talk to you about the actual rebuilding of the temple, the Herod's temple that we're talking about. When, they, when the Babylonians came in and destroyed Solomon's temple, and the people were in the middle of nowhere. They didn't know anyone. They, they, they were distraught and stressed. I want to talk about what God did to build them back up. Because I believe that the body of Christ, and if I can say this is even a prophetic word that God's really been stirring in my heart, the, where the body of Christ is today is what I'm getting ready to show you about the rebuilding of this temple. So let's dive in here. Told you about the Babylonian Empire. All that remains, blah, okay, I won't go into all that. But the city itself was built upon the Euphrates River. It was actually within the area of Mesopotamia area. And if any of you are familiar with the Middle East, the Mesopotamia area is between two rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris River. It's one of the most fertile areas that you can ever imagine. That's what they call the cradle of civilization, where things actually started for us. They believe that even the Garden of Eden is somewhere out there in that area of the Fertile Crescent. Now, Babylonian was actually called Babylon because of the Tower of Babel. So here you've got this this country or this, this nation or people who were just trying to take over everything that they could. So here we have the Jews. They've been taken captive by the Babylons. They come in, they take them, they remove them from their area. Now some of the people stayed behind. Some of the Jews were still there, but they took a lot of the prominent leaders and some of the others back into Babylon with them. While they were there, Persia came in and took over Babylon. So that's where we get Mr. King Cyrus of Persia. King Cyrus of Persia is the one who proclaimed that God commanded him to build a house in Jerusalem. That's why Herod's temple was built to begin with, is because a king of Persia said that God gave him this vision to build this temple. Now, Cyrus decides to release the Jews to go back into Jerusalem. That's great. They're excited, right? They're excited, but when they get there... They're a little bit upset because they see how the house is, the temple is gone. Solomon's temple is gone. So then you've got Ezra who comes in as the priest and he says, Hello, don't be discouraged. Build yourself up. We can do this. Rah, rah, rah. We're going to build the temple. We're going to make it better and greater than it ever, ever was before. Pull them bootstraps up. Let's get to work, right? So the people... They're encouraged by Ezra. They say, okay, let's do this. So here's Zerubbabel. Like I said, he's involved. And there's another guy who's also of the Levite lineage whose name is Jeshua. Jeshua. So Zerubbabel and Jeshua go in, and they start the work to construct the temple. The very first thing you ever do when you're building a building is what? Foundation. That's what they started with. So the whole time that they're there, they're building this foundation. We find out in Ezra chapter 4, they were under a little bit of, uh, let's say, conflict with those around them. People around started saying, wait a minute, King Cyrus just let these people go back in and start this all over again. We just conquered those people. What are they doing? We don't want them to do this. We don't want them to do this. They started giving them a hard time. Judah and Benjamin's enemies is what scripture says. Judah and Benjamin's enemies hear what they're doing, and they start coming in. And at first, they were a little sneaky about it. They said, oh, we're going to come and help you. Yeah, we're going to come help you build your temple. What are you going to do, put more water in the concrete so it doesn't settle right? Yeah, we're going to help you. Anybody who knows anything about foundations will like that. So they even 
when, when Zerubbabel said, no way, Jose, they started getting counselors together. They, they said, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Tell us, how are we going to stop them? How are we going to stop them? Now, I thought to myself when I read this, there's opposition here with building the temple. What kind of opposition do we go through on a daily basis? This is a house right here. We are the temple of God. What opposition did they go through? I said, well, who in the world is Judah and Benjamin's enemies anyway? So I did my homework, read through scripture. Let's look at 2 Kings 17. I find this interesting. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin were the people who had been settled in the land by previous invaders. Remember that when the northern kingdom was taken away by the Assyrians, they were replaced by other people. And that's what we're going to read in 2 Kings 17, verse 24. It says, And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Kamawath <laughs> and Sepharvaim and settled them in the cities of Samaria in the place of the sons of Israel. So when Israel left, they brought in all these other people and said, here, you live there. That's why there was so much opposition. We don't want them to build the temple right here. So they came in and they lived in those cities, and they had to struggle in their new land because the Lord sent lions. Lions among them. And many of the people were being killed. And they figured out what was happening because they didn't know the custom of the God of that land that they were living in. So when they brought back one of the priests into the area, that priest explained to them, hey, you're not following the ways of God, so basically there's a curse on you. That's why these lions are attacking you. Let's look at this next screen here on my um, PowerPoint. I want to just look at these different Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Sephora, whatever that word is. These are the enemies that came against the Israelites or the Jews or the Hebrews that went back into the land. This is what their names mean. Confusion. Babel, confusion, remember the Tower of Babel? Kutha was an ancient city of Sumer. Sumer was one of the original cities that were in the Mesopotamia area. They were considered one of the first civilizations that they have record of. They were known for ziggurats and superstitious beliefs. I guess it's Ava or Ava. To crook or pervert. Hamath means walled. And Sepharvaim is a double city, double-mindedness. Let's stop there for a second. This is what was coming against the people who were trying to build the temple of God. Do you ever feel a little double-minded about things sometimes? Be honest. Do you ever get a little confused about, well, God, what do you want me to do? Do you ever put that wall up? I don't really want to share Jesus today. I just, I just want to be me today. Do you ever pervert the word of God? to make it match up to what you really want in life, okay? These are the things that come against us as Christians. When we get saved, the foundation is laid. Jesus is our rock, and we've got a foundation. And the very first thing the enemy wants to do is throw enemies against us to pull us away, to pull us aside, to discourage us, to keep us from continuing to build this temple. Here's what happened. <clears throat> now, as these um, inhabitants began to approach Zerubbabel, they ask if they might help to build the temple, and again, he says, you know, no, we're not doing it. We're in that same boat today. We've got people that want to come to us, oh, I can help you in your Christian walk. Hello. That's good on one hand, but there are those who want to lead you astray. Let me just read this directly from the website. Mr. Ron Daniel is the gentleman who wrote this. 
We are in the same boat today. As a church, we are always pressured. The idea that we should unite with any church, no matter who they are, because they believe in Jesus. But the Mormons say they believe in Jesus. The Jehovah Witnesses say they believe in Jesus. He says, one woman told me this week that someone is telling her she's not a Christian if she hasn't been baptized according to her church's doctrine. Another gal called us Tuesday night and said that a guy was telling her that if she hasn't spoken in tongues, she's not a Christian. Homosexual churches preach love and tolerance instead of holiness. Rastafarians smoke marijuana and preach that Jesus is one of the many incarnations of God. All of these churches and groups are saying that they, like us, are seeking our God. But in reality, we see they're not seeking the same God. See, Zerubbabel saw what these people were doing, what they were trying to influence him with, and that's why he said no. To partner together with them would be to become, as the Bible calls it, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You might say, how can you call them unbelievers? They're naming the name of Jesus. Ron, ha Ron Daniel says, but I do because the Bible does. Paul called those who legalistically put more requirements on salvation than simple faith in Christ false brethren. And you can find that in Galatians 2.4. Zerubbabel, he told them very pointedly in, uh, in his um, dialogue with them, you have nothing in common with us. This, these attacks that we have in our spirit that cause us to sway, we have nothing to do with this. If we are truly servants of the Most High God and we are serving Jesus, these things right here should not deter us any longer. Amen? Do you understand the confusion that we have? A lot of times can be caused by ourselves right here between our two ears. Now here's what happened. The enemies wrote a letter. These, these enemies of Judah and Benjamin, they wrote this letter. They thought, ooh, this is going to work. They wrote a letter back to Persia who was now under a new king, King Artaxerxes, and they complained that the Jews were rebuilding that wicked and rebellious city, is what they said. Artaxerxes researches this claim and issues a command that the Jews stop building. Judah's enemies use this command to force the construction to stop. They stop building at the foundation. They were discouraged once again. So what did they do? Well, we can't build the temple of God. Let's build our own houses. Let's build them up. Let's make sure our houses are back in order. Some of their homes had been destroyed. Some of them needed to help their other family members to build homes. So they just left the, you know, the house of God and said, let's just worry about our own selves and our own family right now since we can't do anything about the, you know, the, the temple. So they kind of swayed over to the other side until the prophet Haggai decided to show up. Haggai comes in, and he starts prophesying to them. And the, the book of Haggai is only two chapters. If you get a chance, sit down and read it, because the book of Haggai is what I believe that the Lord is speaking to the church today. Consider our ways. Consider, where are you right now? Where, where are we in our relationship with God? Did we just get saved and lay that foundation and then we got discouraged and we just kind of go through the motions? See on Wednesday, see on Sunday. Ooh, we can sing. Everything's great. We'll listen to the word of God. Amen, brother. Preach it. Then we go home and we even live godly lives. We may even make good decisions, godly decisions. But where are you? As God said in the garden to Adam, where are you? I long for a relationship. Remember the temple? You are my temple. I want to dwell with you and abide in you and flow through you. The relationship is so important. You guys have heard me say this before in many different ways. 
but he has built himself a house. We were fashioned and formed in our mother's womb. We are here because God ordained us to be here for such a time as this. Remember the dominoes I had set up here, one of the teachings I did. What we do here affects us there. The things we say to people now will affect them and us later on. My, my son Jonathan, bless his heart, I had no idea. Three, he was three years old, almost four. And he had come to me and he was like so upset about something. He was just going on and on and on. And at some point, you know, as a parent, you're like, wait a minute. I don't care about all that right now. Let's deal with this situation right here. And I even said that, you know, I don't care about all the details and stuff. Let's deal with this head on together. Let's figure this out. He's five, six years old. He's crying. And I said, what is wrong? You told me you didn't care. I said, what are you talking about? When I was three, you said you didn't care. Now, that child remembers everything. He honestly thought I was talking about him. Like, I don't care about this. But he took it as, I don't care about, you know, I don't care about him. It affected him even though I didn't know it. And it was an innocent situation. But for th almost two or three years, that little boy carried it in his heart. He didn't know. We need to be sensitive. Our temple can affect other temples as well. It's very important. So here we have Haggai. I like Haggai. He only prophesied for about four months, and he's considered one of the first minor prophets that ever spoke. But he was not only, he was not only a priest, he was a pastor. He was a comforter. He was someone who encouraged the people to do the work of the ministry. Let's stop worrying about our houses, folks. How can we do that when the house of God isn't even taken care of? But see, the people kept saying, oh, the house of God's okay. You know, we need to worry about our families. Let's see what happened. They began to work on the temple. They decided that the words out of Haggai's mouth were very important, and they were going to start working on the temple. So they did. It says here in Haggai chapter 1, if you can find it in your Bible, you can write it down, Haggai chapter 1. This is what Haggai actually spoke to the people. He said, in the second year, or this, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say that the time is not come yet, the time for the Lord's house to be built. It's not time yet. Well, when is it going to be time? How much more time do they need? It had already been 13 years, folks. 13 years. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple, God's temple, to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. I'm not up here to bring condemnation and say, What are you doing wrong? That's not what that means, and I'll explain in a minute, because the root words of what consider your ways will give you a little bit more of insight on what it means. The people begin to build. They get it built. They're happy. They're rejoicing. Life is great. Nehemiah, on the other hand, is still hanging out. He hasn't quite come into the picture yet. They just built the temple. But Nehemiah is the cup bearer to King Artaxerxes that we were talking about earlier, the very one who said, stop building the temple. Artaxerxes sees he's sad. 
asks him, what's, what's the problem? Why are you so upset? And he said, well, how can I be happy when my homeland, the, the temple and everything is destroyed? I want to go back. The king said, okay, go right ahead. Gave him provision and everything. Go on. Let him go back. So he starts building on the wall, the walled area around the city. And as he's building the wall, Samballat, who is a man in his own little world, Samballat was one of the leaders of the neighboring countries. Samballat is a type of Satan. He started mocking them. Oh, who do you think you are building your wall? You think you're all that? Oh, hmm. We just go boo, and they'll freak out, and they'll stop building, just like they did the, ta- the temple. So they start mocking them and picking on them. You know what Nehemiah did? Love Nehemiah. That's why my son Jonathan has the middle name Nehemiah. He's one of my favorite characters in Scripture. Nehemiah decided, you know what? We're going to plant a little bit of protection around this city. Half of us are going to work, and the other half of us are going to stand guard and watch. We're going to watch and make sure they don't come in here to stop the work of God. You know what? They didn't stop the work of God. They built that wall. They worked as a team, and they got it done. They got it done. That is what I'm talking about. God is awesome. He helps us all to work together as a team to accomplish those things that we could never accomplish without him. Now, we all know in 1 Corinthians 15, 46, it says, That which is spiritual is not first, but that which is natural comes first. After that, the spiritual. Let's look at the story that we just went over. In the natural, Zerubbabel and Joshua, they were both from the Levite lineage, they laid a great foundation, and the temple construction began. The spiritual... As I've shared already, God has laid us a foundation, Jesus Christ. Our temple construction began at salvation, we as the temple of God. When we accepted Christ into our lives, that was the beginning of building this temple. Opposition came to Zerubbabel and those who were building. They came against Zerubbabel and Haggai as they were building the temple. They came against Nehemiah when they brought more people in to build the wall. They had lots of opposition, just like we do in the spiritual realm. We start sharing Jesus with others, and we even allow him to work in our lives. But at some point, we may decide, well, you know what? Salvation's enough. I'm a good person. I don't really need to pray that much. And we let that complacency come in. And that double-mindedness, remember the enemies of Judah and Benjamin? We let double-mindedness come in. In the natural, the prophet Haggai stepped up to the plate. He spoke a word that encouraged all of them to begin their work again. I feel like Haggai today. I want to encourage you. Begin the work again. If you feel like you have stopped building your relationship with God, and you feel like you have really stopped focusing on those areas in your life that you know God wants to work on, now's the time. Consider your ways. Jesus didn't just die for our past sins, folks. He died for all of our sins. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. Our past sins, our current sins, our future sins, If we confess with our mouth, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He will do it. Now, I'll read this this scripture. You know, this this is Haggai 1. We're going to look in Haggai 1, verse 4. I found this so interesting. Again, this is what Haggai said. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. They were dwelling in their paneled houses. They were dwelling. What does the word paneled mean? You ready for this? To hide by covering, figuratively to reserve. 
What are we reserving from God? Are we hiding in our paneled houses, holding a part of ourselves back from God? Well, no, no, Lord, you can't go in that, little, that, that closet. I ain't going to let you in there. We don't need to be reserved with him. We need to have unbridled relationship with him no matter what, totally open. So are we dwelling in our reservation, our paneled houses, while this temple lies in ruins? What is the temple? The definition of temple is house. The root word means especially family and children. What we do affects our children and our family. If we hide behind our paneled houses and we don't take part in allowing God to do a work on the inside of this temple, it's going to affect people. It's going to affect everyone around us, starting with our family and our children. Then Haggai says, consider your ways. This is awesome. Consider your ways. Commit. This is what consider means, to commit, to give. It, this is really awesome. To unheart, U-N-H-E-A-R-T, to unheart or transport with love to the highest. Consider your ways. Ways is a course or mode of action. I believe that it is time for us to consider our ways. We need to get out of our fog and take time to get on our knees and pray. Start tonight when you go home, right there at the bed. You know, Pastor Bob and Susan, they kneel by their bed, one on one side, one on the other. They reach all the way across the bed, hold hands and pray. We got to start somewhere. We can be good people, we could be good Christians, but it's time to consider our ways and let more than just that foundation be built in our lives. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. One of the things Haggai said was, be strong, all you people of the land. This is what he encouraged them with. Be strong, all you people out there. And work, for God is with you. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Don't be afraid of what God is going to do in you. In this last part here, we have our tent, our earthly body. We read that in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tent or tabernacle will dissolve, that we have a building of God, not made with hands, but eternal in heaven. Here we go again, talking about temples, tents. We are also the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, purchased with a preciousness, and paid for, made his own. So then honor God and bring glory to him in your body. Everything that we do with our body should glorify him. Last scripture. We are not just a tent. We are not just a temple. We will be in a mansion one day. In John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. And I would like to read this in the Amplified. Do not let your hearts be troubled and distressed and agitated. You believe in and adhere to and trust in and rely on God. Well, believe in and adhere to and trust and rely also on me. Who said that? Jesus he is not going to come in and tell you to cut this off, glue this here, stick that there, and totally devastate you. He will walk with you in a gentle way. He is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's not going to come in and say, do this, do this, don't do this. He will very gently show you what area he wants to work on in your life. And the quicker we yield, the quicker it's dealt with. Amen? Verse 2, 
in my father's house there are many dwelling places or homes. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I am going away to prepare a place for you. What's Jesus doing? He's not just sitting at the right hand of the Lord, you know, always making intercession for us. Yes, he's doing that. But he's preparing a place for us. And when I... When, if I go and make ready a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Is that awesome? He is creating a mansion for us. And a lot of people think, oh, it's a wonderful building, Pastor Bob. It's going to have all these wonderful dishes and china. and oh, It's not, I believe he's creating some of that. But this body, this glorified body that he's going to give us is considered a mansion. Remember, he walked through walls. He transported from one place to another. He was able to eat. He ate a bunch of fish. Our glorified body is nothing that we can even imagine. But guess what it is? It's still a temple of God. So I want to encourage you. If you stopped at the foundation in your salvation, and maybe you even walked with God for a little while, and you've gotten into a routine of Christianity, I encourage you, go home. Spend quality time with him. Well, he's not speaking to me. I pray, but I never hear anything. Are you listening? You know what I do sometimes? I'll just sit there and say, Lord, I don't want nothing. Speak to my heart. Just speak to my heart. I'm here. Just tell me what you want me to do. Tell me what you want me to say. What do, you, what do I do today, Lord? Whatever you want, speak to my heart. And you know what? Not every thought is your own. And when that thought comes across, it's like, or that impression in your spirit, is that you, Lord? Test the spirit. Find out whether it's God or not. Hey, you're going about your day, and all of a sudden, Pastor Bob comes across your your spirit, and you're like, oh, wait, I wonder what Pastor Bob's doing. That could mean you need to be praying for him. You never know. Seek the Lord with all your heart, and consider our ways as we grow in our relationship with him. Amen? Amen. Amen.